Welcome back to Asian Art. Today we're going to look at another kind of art that has been influenced by Zen teachings and philosophy. The art of tea, the tea ceremony, or chado, which has brought together the idea of Zen Buddhism and the idea of wabi. Chado, the way of tea, or the tea ceremony, was a, a long-practiced uh, art in Japan. It came also from China. And it was uh, infused with Buddhist teachings and Buddhist practices and meditation. When it first arrived in Japan, it was a very elite art. It was one, a ceremony where people might show off their wealth and bring out uh, fancy, expensive Chinese porcelains and exotic teas. And they might include all kinds of uh, ingredients along with their teas and foods and other things and competitions and other events that might be associated with the tea. It is really the thinking of one particular tea master, Sen no Rikyo, that really instigates what we now know as the modern tea ceremony, who brings about this change in thinking toward a kind of more minimal approach, and one that uh, tries to respect the very simple and elegant elements of the tea ceremony. Sen no Rikyo was the tea master to the very powerful shogun Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and in that he was brought this aesthetic to the tea ceremony, became known as wabi. Wabi is a very interesting word that is difficult to translate. It roughly means a kind of old-fashioned, but it also implies this idea of something being astringent, now, when something is astringent, that's sort of like a quality of like a lemon, where that sort of puckering power it has. It really is sort of drawing back in on itself. Astringents also have certain medicinal qualities in that they are sanitary. Things like lemons and such are good for sanitizing things. And so this sense of cleanliness, a sense of restraint, a sense of the idea of something being rustic or old-fashioned. But rustic and old-fashioned, not in a kind of, uh, you know, cracker barrel scent of way. I mean, really something much more basic than that. Something like the design of an old barn, where only the sort of form and structure of something essential is there. Here we see a descendant of Senno Rikyo conducting a tea ceremony. You see him there dressed in black. Uh, he has prepared the tea and his assistant is about to transfer the tea to the host. A tea ceremony is a rather small, quiet affair where a host is honored and everything about the tea ceremony is sort of geared to making them feel appreciated and welcome. To begin with, let's look at the tea building, which in today's construction can be one of the most expensive buildings because every part of it has to be constructed literally by hand. Each piece of wood is carefully chosen for its unique qualities and characteristics. Land is extremely valuable in Japan, and so most tea houses or tea rooms are an addition inside a building. It is uh, quite a luxury to see here a tea house that is separate from the building. This is sort of the ideal, and that there should be a path through a garden. And as you see from the diagram here on the left, this is sort of a straight path right to the tea house. It's a very meandering path, one that requires a kind of diversions and redirections. The idea is that you're not supposed to sort of rush to do it and quickly finish and be off to some other bit of business. The tea ceremony is supposed to transport you. 
supposed to slow you down. And we can see a stream that runs across the property, in a sense, kind of cutting our journey, making us move from the space of everyday life into this very special space of the tea ceremony. When you come around the corner to the tea house, you might be surprised to see the entrance to the tea tour is really quite small. You can't walk into it. You must crawl into it. You must bow yourself down. This was a feature that Sendo Rikyo introduced as a way of humbling ourselves before the tea ceremony. He worked for a very powerful and rather arrogant man, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and he would come striding into a building with his samurai swords, and here everything needs to be kind of taken down a notch. Anybody who walks into this, comes into the building, must humble themselves. And at this moment that you submit yourself to the tea ceremony, you're in a sense sort of submitting yourself to the ceremony whereby everyone who in the participants are more or less equal. And so this is a, a, a really dramatic shift from a very status conscious and very status prone society people come to. Another really beautiful quality of the tea house is this alcove, which is a small sort of feature inside the room, um, which is separate, where a, a kind of a scroll with uh, calligraphy and uh, perhaps a ikebana, a flower arrangement, a very simple, just a few flowers or one flower, might appear in this alcove. And this is supposed to be a kind of greeting and a welcoming and create the ambiance that is unique to this occasion. So the choice of flower, the message on the calligraphy, the style of the calligraphy, all of these things would reflect the occasion, uh, the relationship between the host and the guest, and uh, the season and all these things coming together in the tokonoma. One great story here is when Toyotomi Hideyoshi knew the chrysanthemums were in bloom, he commanded his tea master, Senno Rikyo, to prepare a tea ceremony so he could come and enjoy his chrysanthemums. When he arrived, he noticed that every single chrysanthemum had been cut from every single bush in his tea garden. He was furious. He had come with the expressed purpose to see this. And so when he finally goes into the tea house, he sees in the alcove a single chrysanthemum. And Senno Rikyo politely explained, if I had shown you all the chrysanthemums, you would not have appreciated their beauty. The tea utensils for a tea ceremony are all carefully selected. Some are freshly made, some are part of what a tea master has made himself, others are bowls and instruments that have been passed down. Here are the tea equipment for the ancestor of Senno Rikyo, and we can see this rather corroded iron brazier. This is a brazier and has been passed down through the Senno Rikyo's family for generations to come. The way the tea ceremony is prepared, tea is actually a powdered form. It's in a little small container and the small delicate bamboo spoon is carried out. The tea bowl here we see center uh, was first wiped out with warm water and then the tea powder is placed in and then hot water is placed over the tea powder and this sort of whisk we see on the right is used to stir up a kind of frothy, bitter liquid, which is bright, bright green, sort of dark, bright uh, green tea. One of the most expensive objects in the tea ceremony is the bowl itself. And this can be a very uh, important element of the tea ceremony are the tea bowls. Now to look upon a tea bowl 
is to be surprised by its humility. It is a very rustic looking bowl. And in fact, when the tea bowls were first used, they were not even intended to be tea bowls. They were rice bowls. They were peasants rice bowls. They were bowls that were intended to serve food to the very poor. Uh, and this is a made in a method which was really very simple. Where in most ceramics, you heat the clay body until the glaze melts very slowly over a long period of time. And then you cool it off very slowly. And that allows for the glaze to set properly and everything to appear uh, in a very fine finished form. In this rather inexpensive way, you heat the object very quickly and then the glaze melts and just as it's kind of first liquefied and molten in its character, the glazing then is taken out of the kiln and plunged into either water or into uh, pine needles or other combustibles to quickly, quick cool it down. This, of course, makes it very inexpensive. You don't have all that wood and it's a very slow process of heating and cooling. But it also creates very unpredictable results. This Raku method uh, was developed by Sasaki Chojiro and in Korea and became a very important aesthetic quality that Senno Rikyo enters introduced into the tea ceremony. These very uniquely shaped, humble tea bowls were meant to remind people of the kind of poverty and humility and simplicity, and also very organic. There are no two tea bowls that are alike, and that is what makes them so special and unique. The tea bowls are also more ideally suited uh, for this occasion. Prior to this, they would use these Chinese porcelain vessels that would be very brittle, very hard, and they would the heat of the tea would go to the exterior of the bowl, meaning you would make the tea and then it had to sit there till the bowl was cold enough that you could actually pick it up and drink it. Now with the tea bowl such as this, there's a greater uh, air in this, and so this insulated, naturally insulated. So you can pick up these tea bowls immediately after making the tea, and it keeps the tea at a good warm temperature throughout. Here is a variety of different tea bowls through different kinds of techniques and varying, and you can see how really very varied they can be. They are hand-built or wheel-built, but they are never finely finished especially the rim of the bowl, you start to see a great deal of unevenness. And this is deliberately done. No tea bowl should be or appear so finished that it doesn't not feel handmade. This idea of a very handmade quality, something that someone uniquely made for this occasion. And they should fit in the cupped hands very generously to feel like a really uh, open, warm gift that the host is giving to the guest. These ways in which people appreciate these moments, these ways in which the, the tea bowl has these unique personalities, so that when the drinker pulls the bowl up to their mouth to take a drink, they're to look across the rim of the bowl and imagine a distant horizon. Here is one of the most celebrated bowls in history. I kid you not. If you were to see this, you might think it's some kind of accident or a mistake. But in fact, it is a priceless national treasure from the 16th century. And this tea bowl is legendary, uh, such that it commands extraordinary reverence. And it, of course, it looks to us like the most crudely mistaken piece of pottery with every imaginable crack and break in it and chipped and bubbled glaze. And yet there's something so natural and so humble. This bowl was never made to be 
a tea bowl. It was, in, like I say, a rice bowl made from Korea. But it has been, in a sense, celebrated for its humility, for its simplicity, for its lack of art. It's no intention to be anything other than what it is, the most basic and humble of tea bowls. Here I want to take a digression to talk about this idea of wabi, this aesthetic of restraint, and show how it manifests itself in these Zen gardens of Japan. These are the most austere of gardens and are a celebrated way in which that sense of the garden as an, a, an abode, a sanctuary of repose, of quiet, has been transformed into something very unique. Here at the Temple of the Peaceful Garden, Roanji, in 1473, it was established, the artist, team master, and Zen Buddhist Soami constructed a garden out of a field of gravel with a series of 15 stones. Now, when you think of garden, you tend to think of plants, but really the only thing growing here is a little bit of moss around the base of the stones. It's essentially we call it a dry garden. The sand and gravel has been carefully raked in a very significant pattern. Let's look at the plan view of this garden. And you'll see that the stones are placed in this field, which is about the size of a tennis court, in a series of, of little islands. And the rings around these rocks create like rivulets or, or breaks from this calm water, creating this idea that we're actually looking at this sort of vast landscape, not just a series of rocks in a sandy field, but a far distant sort of world that we are entering into. Here is this design, as you see now, that you can get the feeling of the islands and the calm. A very unique illusion that comes from these pairings of these rocks is as you stand and look at them, there's no place along the edge of the garden where you can view it, where you can see all of the stones at the same time. It's been designed in some way so that at least one stone is hidden from view at all times. This way in which the stones sort of reveal themselves as you move through the space creates this idea of a sort of progress, a transition, a way of entering through the space and the sense of the illusory nature of reality, the sort of Buddhist idea that we cannot wholly, fully comprehend our journey at the beginning. Here is one of my favorite Zen gardens uh, from San Francisco, the Tea Garden in Golden Gate Park. I highly recommend if you're ever in San Francisco to make a journey to the Tea Garden there. And here you'll see this sort of illusion as you're walking through this rather small part of the garden. Uh, the gravel has been raked to make it look like undulating waves the sort of little grassy island, the distance between the bush is actually a tree in the distance, and the rocks over at the far end are distant mountains. And so in a small space, we are given to imagine a much larger sense of an atmosphere and sort of opening ourselves up to this calm and quiet location. <laughs> 